Good to see you all this morning, and uh, I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Before we get in there, um, as you're finding it, um, I just want to let you know that a couple years ago, um, I was in a point in my life where I really needed spiritual renewal. Um, I, I needed a refresh. I needed a restart. Um, and so the Lord really led me to Isaiah 40. So a couple years ago, what I did was I spent 40 days in Isaiah 40. Um, and I, I have that like laid out like every day for 40 days. Uh, and so that was meaningful to me. I've actually led uh, one of our sons through that for 40 days. He was in a point where he needed renewal in his life. Uh, and so it was a process I've gone through multiple times for me. Uh, and so I, I brought us to Isaiah 40 because um, I, I think there's probably people here who need spiritual renewal. I, I think you might need that um, just as much as I, I do and I continue to need that in my life. And so um, I just want you to understand where this, where this sermon series is coming from. It's tied into the one we just did before, of course, uh, but it's also very specific for right now. So here's, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll give you a gift if you want this, and you, it's going to require you to send me an email because I'm not going to send it out to everybody, okay? Um, if you want those 40 days uh, laid out, uh, I'll send it to you. Uh, it's not my, it's, it's something I made up. I didn't grab it from somewhere else. Um, and if you would like that, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, you can find my email on the website if you want to. Um, also in the signature of my email is my uh, direct text message. So I'm accessible to you. You can text me. You might think that's weird. Can I really text my pastor? Yes. <laughs> I welcome communication. Uh, and so text me. Sometimes it takes me a little to get back to people, but that's okay. Um, but if you want those 40 days, send me a note and I'll send it to you um, as we're going through this together. So hopefully by now you're in Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to be looking today at verses 6 down to verses 11. And um, I'm going to read for us these verses for us and then we'll get into it a little bit this morning. Isaiah 40 starting in verse 6. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Get you up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to that passage. We're going to walk it through this morning uh, as we try to understand what Isaiah is getting to at this point uh, in the whole book, okay? So uh, some of you are familiar with the law of inertia. The law of inertia, yeah, you know, if I state it wrong, you, gotta keep, you keep me straight and, and square, Janie, okay? Okay, the law of inertia simply says that things that are in motion tend to stay in motion, and things that are at rest tend to stay at rest. Did I nail it? Okay, good. Got a science teacher up here, better watch out what I'm saying. The law of inertia is very simple. If you are moving in a certain direction and you're already going that direction, it, it's going to take some sort of external force to stop that. Or if things are at rest, to get it going, there needs to be some sort of external force onto that to get it going. That's the law of inertia. Isaiah chapter 40 is like this external force being put onto God's people who are in a very desperate situation. They've got themselves stuck. By their own choices, by their decisions, by things that they have done, their spiritual vibrancy has completely disappeared. They have disobeyed. They have turned their back on God. They are stuck, and they need a fresh start. Hey, Al, can you throw me a water bottle right there, please? I've had a cold this week, and if I go at this pace for the next, like, three hours of my life, I'm going to, like, die. Well, maybe not die but I won't be able to speak. I really haven't spoken much since Wednesday. It's the first time I've really spoken, so here we are. So, you see, this is God's people, okay? 
They're, they're stuck. They've got themselves in this position in their life. And I, I wonder sometimes that that might sound a lot like you. <laughs> it sounds a lot like me sometimes. I get myself in certain situations where I'm just stuck. Bad choices, things I've done. I, I, I've blown it. Maybe you've blown it today. Maybe you're at a point like you're just completely, royally messed up your life. And you're like, I don't know. I, I don't, where do I go? What am I supposed to do? Everything is a mess. You know, you're in good company. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's okay to not be okay this morning. You came to church, you got dressed, you look nice, you really do. You all smell good. <laughs> At least as far as I can tell, maybe I can't smell, I don't know. <laughs> And it's easy to put on a veneer that everything's okay, it's a, everything's good in life, and, and, yet, and yet the moment you walk out of this place into the realities of your life, things are a complete wreck. And you're thinking, is there any way out for me? How do I get out of this? I, I've made so many bad choices in my life. Let me tell you, friends, if you have screwed up your life, it doesn't have to be the end of your story. It doesn't have to be. This morning, I've got good news I've got good news for those who have a checkered past, who are shady. <laughs> the characters of life, you know, or you're like, maybe I'm one of those shady characters. It's not the end of your story. A complete turnaround is possible in your life. It's entirely possible. This morning is a catalytic moment for you, for us, to get us back on track with God. Back on track, excuse me. And Isaiah 40 these verses I just read, if we will honestly just sit with them and listen to what Isaiah is saying, can be the external force for a catalytic moment in your life. It's good news. Renewal comes through refocusing our attention onto God. There's no other way. There's no other way to get to a point of renewal in your life. There's no other way to have a turnaround. There's no other way to kind of get yourself out of a situation you've got you in to a better situation except to refocus your attention on the greatness of God. That is it. And so if you're in that moment and you're like, how do I get out of this? Focus on God. Individually, focus on Him. Turn your attention to Him. As a church, I believe as a church, from our, my vantage point where I sit, that, that we are in what I'm calling a zone of renewal. And if we're not careful, we're going to get our eyes off the ball, so to speak. We're, we're going to get our attention off of who is the center stage in this church, and we're going to focus on something else. In this zone of renewal, we've got to focus our attention back on God. I'm going to start in verse 9, right at the middle of this and I'm going to grab a drink while I'm, before I go on. <laughs> if you look at verse 9, verse 9 is the center of where we're going right now. And it is simply telling us God is good news. God is good news. We could even say it this way for those of you that understand what I'm going to say. God is the gospel. God is the gospel. God is good news. Look at verse 9. He says, get you up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Good news is being proclaimed by Isaiah to people who have messed up their life. O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. And he's saying, you've got to draw people's attention to behold your God. Behold your God. God is good news. It's the first thing I want us to see. Uh, and I want to illustrate it this way. Um, um, you've probably been to a dinner party at some point in your life, or you've been to a wedding reception of some kind. Uh, and inevitably what happens at a wedding reception or a dinner party is someone picks up their cup like this, and what do they do? And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how loud it is in the room, right? Everyone hushes down. Everyone gets quiet down. Now, if you, you know if we're at a wedding reception, you'll go like this. And then everyone looks at the bride and groom and they have a little kiss. And everyone's, yay! 
I kissed again. And then it's just like over and over again. And there it is. At, at a dinner party, so it goes like this. They say, can I have your attention, please? I've got something that I want to say. And then they grab the attention of the room. They say, can I have your attention, please? I think verse 9 is heaven clinking on the glass. Dink, dink, dink. Hello. I have something to say to you. Can I have your attention, please, heaven is saying. Behold your God. Behold your God. Look at him. And the way Isaiah writes it here is that it's not a passing glance at God. We're such distracted people, aren't we? The way that Isaiah says it here is, don't just give a passing glance and and say, oh, look, look, there's God, and then move on. How easy it is for us to do that, right? We come to church or we do whatever we're going to do, and we just, we give a glance, but we don't literally stop and stare, which is the nature of this word to behold, is to stop and stare at your God. Stare at him. Stop everything and just stare at him. Because why? Because he's saying there's, there's good news coming out of this guy, out of this God of yours who is there. He is good news for you. And I think this is so important for the context here because this is a group of people who have been so distracted. They're living a life that is giving them in a place where they don't want to be. And it's almost as if heaven is calling them back to God. He is good news. He's good news. And so we want to give our full attention, our full captivation, because he is captivating. He is wonderful. He is absolutely amazing. Uh, Some of you probably saw this past week the Aurora Borealis. If I said that wrong, excuse my way I can't speak very clearly today. Uh, Did anyone see them? A couple of you saw them? Uh, Cameron took some amazing pictures. Uh, You should see them if you can can show it to them. Uh, Other people probably saw them as well. It's amazing, right? Uh, You know, just recently we had the eclipse where people, you know, went cuckoo about an eclipse. (laughs) It was amazing. I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not taking away from the eclipse. It's just people went like, they traveled far distances to go see the eclipse. It's like everything stopped. You know, people traveling to far distances to get to where there's no light pollution so they can see the, the, the northern lights. I mean, when friends, when something captivates us, we'll go to great lengths to get to it. Staying up till 1 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, just to get a glimpse of something. We're like, this is amazing. I'm never going to see this again. Uh, how many of us are willing to do whatever to get a glimpse of God? Now, I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone who went to go uh, to, to do those things or the eclipse or the, the northern lights. I'm simply saying, when something captivates your attention and you're like, I want to see that thing, you'll do anything to get it. So will I. Has God captured our attention to the point where we literally will do anything just to get a glimpse of him? Or are we so distracted by other things, giving a glance to him, but like, ah, oh, whatever. How easy it is for us. In this zone of renewal, our full attention has to be lifted up to behold God. There is no other way. That is the only way forward. The passage tells us there's some good news about this God. First one, verses 6 to 8. Here's some good news. You are frail, but God is faithful. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, that is good news for you to hang your life on. You are frail. So am I. I can barely speak this morning. That doesn't matter. I am frail. You are frail. God is faithful. Look at the passage. This is the message. What am I going to cry to these people? What do I say to these people? Verses, chapters 1 to 39. Tell them they're grass. <laughs> Great message, right? Hey, come to church this morning. You're a bunch of grass. <laughs> They're grass. All of their beauty or all of their constancy is what the word means. All of it, they're like a flower of the field. Now the flowers of the field grow. They're beautiful. Everything's in bloom like crazy. Allergies are going crazy. Whatever it may be, there's blooming things going on. And it's amazing. The grass is growing. My grass is growing. So is yours. Things grow. They flourish. But the point is this, they're frail. 
the grass in a few months from now will be gone. Those flowers will disappear. And yes, there's a cycle of creation that is part of it. That's, that's normal. That's natural. And he's saying to them, remind the people that they are frail. That they don't have what it takes. That is good news. You may not feel like that's good news. Maybe you want to think, well, I can make it through. No, you can't. You're frail. You're weak. So am I. The breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, verse 8. The flowers fade. But the word of our God will stand forever. That is good news. It is very good news to people who are frail and weak and have got themselves in a really bad situation. So here's the truth. The truth is that we long for change, but we want nothing to change. Your body will change. Uh, your childhood house will change. Your relationships will change. Your career will change. But there is one thing that remains forever. God's word. His word will stand forever. So when everything else changes in your life, your body changes, your relationships, your career, whatever it may be, you fill in the blank. There is one thing that is an anchor for your soul. God's word. God's word. His promises. Now, if you remember, you know, last week, if you're with us, that's fine. If you were not, but last week we talked about how if we're going to have a fresh start in life, uh, it begins with the promises of God. The promises of God in verses 1 to 5 are pretty simple for us to understand. His word is that there's going to be forgiveness of sin. That there's going to be grace and there's going to be you know, forgiveness and freedom and these things and new life. You see this in verses 1 to 5. And then the other promise is that, that anything that's standing in the way of God, any obstacle that is standing in his way, he's going he's to remove. God cannot be stopped at what, his, what he's going to do. He can't be stopped. And so when he comes down here now in verse 8 and says, the word of our God will stand forever, he's building on those promises and saying, these promises will never change. Forgiveness of sin through the Messiah and the reversal of everything that is stopping and getting in the way of God's word being fulfilled in your life. So these, these verses remind us of our frailty, but they remind us of God's faithfulness that in every age of your life, and in every stage that you're going through, his word will remain. It's sometimes said there's only two things that are eternal. The souls of men and the word of God. Everything else is just going to fade away. That doesn't mean we shouldn't spend our time doing things like that. But we should also understand that if we want spiritual renewal to happen in our life, we've got to understand what is eternal. And give our best efforts to those things. And give ourselves to those things. The souls of men and the word of God. Great is your faithfulness to me. We just sang it a few minutes ago. Todd kind of warmed you up. Can we say that out loud again? Great is your faithfulness to me. Say it with me. Great is your faithfulness to me. Through every stage, every age, his word will endure forever. Bank your life on it. Heaven is calling our attention. Bank your life on his word. Second, verses 10 through 11. Here's some good news for you and me. You will fail. But God never does. You will fail. God never fails. So you look at verse 10. He says here, Behold the Lord God comes with might. It's very important for us to understand, for them to understand the Lord God is coming to them, which means he has not abandoned them. He's not at a distance from them. He's not you know, disappointed. He's not as if it's like, well, I'd, you know, get yourself out of that hole you got in. He's saying, no, you got yourself there. I am coming to you because you failed. You messed it up. You screwed it up. And he's saying, I am coming to you the presence of God when we fail. That's so good. 
It's so good for us to understand that nobody is out of the reach of God's grace. No matter how far you think you have gone, God will come to you. He comes. And the way he comes, there's three ways he comes to us in here, in these verses here. First, you see this, he comes as conquering king. So he says he comes with might and his arm rules for him. It has the connotations of a, of a conquering king, a ruling arm, a king of kings, you could say, who comes as one who conquers with might, with power. Second, he comes as a wealthy benefactor, you could say, or a wealthy giver. He comes there, you could say, with his reward is with him. Well, what's his reward? His reward is forgiveness and grace, eternal life with him. He comes as this wealthy benefactor, this one who comes to give life, new life and freedom. And then he comes, you see, in verse 11, as a great leader. He comes with tenderness. He comes with wanting to gather his lambs in his arm. He carries them. He gently leads them. And so he comes to us in those two ways, a conquering king, a wealthy giver, and just a great leader. A great leader. All of those things describe Jesus. Jesus is the conquering king. Jesus is the one who's the wealthy benefactor. Jesus is the one who is the great shepherd, the leader of God's people. And so he's saying, you got yourself there. This is what you need to behold about God. Yes, you're going to fail. You're going to mess it up. But God is going to come to you in these ways, conquering king, wealthy giver, great leader. This is how he comes to us. So when we fail, God is coming to us in Jesus. It's good to remember the words of Jesus that he says he came for the sick. He came for those who were in need of a doctor. He didn't come to those who thought they had it all together. The religious elite of the day, so to speak, who were actually making fun of Jesus for hanging out with people and who were Sinners and tax collectors. <laughs> I think we put all ourselves in that category and be grateful to have a dinner party with Jesus. Friends, your failure in life does not need to define you. Whatever it is in your life, whatever it is this morning, you say, that is where I have failed. You are not locked into the prison of your failures. God has come to us in our failures with the keys and he has unlocked the door. Of the prison. And he has set you free. Now you have to walk out. you got to get out. You, you, it's, uh, you know, can you imagine sitting in a prison and the guy came and the, the arm guard came and unlocked the door and you just sat there? Be like, and he'd be like, you can go. And you're like, kind of like it in here. No one would do that. They'd be like, jailbreak, right? Let's go. There's a jailbreak going on. Are you going to get out of that prison? Are you going to lock yourself into somewhere that you're already set free from? He never fails. He will come. Heaven is heralding this good news to you. Behold your God. So here we are in the zone of renewal. And what happens next is crucial. You know, if, just to use a sports analogy, when you've got a team that's locked in, they're in the zone. Like, they're just like, whew, they're in the zone. <laughs> Nothing can distract them unless something does, <laughs> which can happen. In this zone of renewal, you and I can get distracted by our frailty. You and we can get distracted by our failure, and it takes our attention off of God. The point here he's saying is, what happens next is crucial. Behold your God. Stop and stare at him. Stay locked in. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to experience spiritual renewal in your life? To give the best of your attention to God. To not take your eyes off of him. Has he got your attention? Let me pray for us. Respond this morning. A song God's faithfulness to us. Father, we come before you this morning and we are people of distraction. We are a people who easily can get our eyes off of what you've done for us. 
And so, Father, I just pray for your help and your grace over us this morning. For those that are here, those that are struggling with sin in their life, they've got themselves in a bad situation, I pray that they would behold your goodness to them, your faithfulness to them. Would you wash over us this morning with grace and kindness for our goodness, but ultimately for the advance of your name. We receive that kindness this morning, that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen.